Hi everyone, this is Britt Simon. Uh, so I wanted to go live and um, just give a little bit of information and try and uh, get some clarity about what's going on um, with the lawsuit, etc., with uh, Judge Mehta's uh, lawsuit. Um, there's been some developments and I've put some information on Twitter, which I think is accurate, but, um, but obviously people are sort of struggling to come to terms with what I'm saying. So I thought I would jump online here and just um, clarify that. So uh, hello, Stefando123. Um, so, uh, and I'm doing great, thank you. Um, hey, Puda, how you doing? Uh, good, to, good to see you online. Um, okay, so um, <laughs> I'm just seeing if I've got some questions here. So let me let me just firstly say let's just hold your questions right and uh let's just hold the questions for the moment and let me explain what has happened today or uh you know what's happened over the last few days so um some of you may understand that the um the good luck case and the jacob slash rosalis case and some of the other smaller cases were uh, consolidated in front of Judge Meta. So we basically have sort of two main tracks going. One is the Go case, which was a different sort of case. And um, and then there's the Good Luck case, right? And, and the Good Luck case now encompasses the arguments from Rosales, Jacob. Jacob was the original name of, of the lawsuit. For a while, we've been calling that Rosales because the plaintiff, uh, a Mr. Jacob, is now lo no longer part of the, the suit. But nevertheless, that suit seems to be known by the courts by uh, by its original name, Jacob, even though uh, Curtis has been calling it Rosales, right? So Rosales, or Jacob, was the case where uh, Curtis Morrison had made um, a part of that uh, case was to be, um, uh, was to convert the case into a class action. A class action meaning representing all people that were not actually named on the um, on the lawsuit, um, as well as the people named on the lawsuit, right? But there was a hearing the other day, and during that hearing, and and Curtis is what's happened today is Curtis has made that transcript available, um, and uh, it gave me and others opportunity to read through the transcript and try and read between the lines of what happened because um, the, the, the hearing happened. Um, I hadn't been attending the hearing. I was too busy with work, unfortunately. Um, and so I had not heard what was said. And it, it would have been very clear to me if I had what was going on. But um, after that uh, lawsuit, or after that hearing rather, Curtis then withdrew the motion, Curtis and Raphael Renya and, and their team, withdrew the motion for um, making Rosales or Jacob into a class action. Um, and by doing so, uh, I felt that they were trying to focus on the named plaintiffs, and they've got about 24,000 named plaintiffs in that case, the named plaintiffs in preference uh, first, because there's been a lot of conversation about um, why are the named plaintiffs not being given priority? So people are really confused about the high, whole priority thing as well. And, and, you know, perhaps we should just quickly recap that from DV 2020. In DV 2020, on September 4th, there was an order which restarted uh, processing of, um, of, of visas for DV lottery, DV 2020. At that time, um, the Gomez suit... Uh, was a class action, or it, it was um, it was asked to be a class action. It was always always set up to be a class action. That was represented by a team of lawyers, um, and they actually didn't get approval for it to be a class action until the very last day of September, on September thirtieth. And I'll come to that in a moment. But uh, in between September fourth and September thirtieth. There was kind of a, a the the order that was given by Judge Meta at that time said process everybody, but in particular process these named plaintiffs, right? So named plaintiffs in certain cases, all the cases, Gomez, Aker, Mohammed, and Fongjong, but not Kennedy, 
were given kind of a priority. Uh, and most of them by far, um, you know, were processed, but there was only about 1,000, 1,500 people. It wasn't a great deal of people. And actually six or 7,000 uh, visas were issued in between the time between September 4th and September 30th. Um, so most of the people that got visas last year in DV 2020 were not named plaintiffs, right? They were any other cases. Now, then on September 30th, uh, Judge Mehta certified the class action under the Gomez case, made the lawyers who uh, had who had um, filed that case, the Gomez case, uh, which was the Ayla team, um, Jesse Bless and, and uh, the people from Mayor Brown, etc. He made those lawyers responsible for the class, and he also reserved 9,095 visas, right? Um, and that that was that class was protected, um, and it protected everyone. But it also reserved this nine thousand and ninety five visas. And then just recently in DV twenty twenty, Judge Meta has explained that he's going to order the government to issue those nine thousand and ninety five visas. The class is protected, but there's going to be no specific. Um, uh, prioritization towards named plaintiffs, remaining named plaintiffs or not. There's just going to be 9,095 visas and they'll be used, you know, in a, a an order yet to be decided. Okay. So, um, so you can see that from DV 2020, there was a benefit. Uh, and people don't understand this for some reason. People say, oh, there was no named plaintiffs priority. There was a benefit for named plaintiffs in DV 2020. Uh, the government were reporting on their uh, on those cases on a you know more or less a, uh, you know a very frequent basis and trying to impress the judge between September the fourth and September the thirtieth with the actions they'd taken specifically for the named plaintiffs. But meanwhile, embassies around the world did a great job in reaching out to people who'd been cancelled. You know, had their interviews cancelled cancelled in March, April, and May. Rescheduled those interviews didn't need any help from KCC to do that. And that's where the majority of the um, uh, of the visas came from, actually. It was from embassies doing their, their job, uh, you know, as quickly as they possibly could. KCC spent their time on the named plaintiffs, basically. And they, they did a few extra interviews, but not many. There were about a thousand interviews uh, that uh, were arranged uh, in that final uh, three weeks by KCC. Whereas the majority of the of the cases actually came through, uh, you know, already already arranged but previously cancelled interviews. Okay, so hopefully that's clear. Now in DV twenty twenty one, Judge Metro has said, look, there's going to be no prioritization for named plaintiffs. Um, if I do anything in terms of a reservation order, I'll do that, but I'm not going to I'm not going to sort of order the government to do uh, you know something particularly for named plaintiffs plaintiffs versus non-named plaintiffs. And right now, he's ordering the government to make best, uh, be all good faith efforts, etc. And again, that's not for named plaintiffs, it's for any cases. That's that's the way Judge Meta sees things. That's what he did, right? Um, that's what he did last year, except that because the government were having to report on uh, on those named plaintiffs, they got a little bit of a preference in some way, but not the only preference, right? So Judge Mehta is being pretty consistent in the way he's acting from last year to this year. He's being consistent, I believe. Let me just check. Uh, I just want to check something. Make sure I'm not talking without you being able to hear me. Yeah, it looks like you're, you're hearing me. Um, okay, so, uh, so then back to this week. So the hearing happens. And during the hearing, Judge Mehta was making it clear, as far as I can read from the transcript, transcript that he was not impressed with the um, with the application for converting the Rosales case into a class action. He, it seems like um, he wasn't, he just wasn't impressed with it for whatever reason. I don't want to sort of um, be critical of that or be critical of, of the lawyers regarding that. But he made it pretty clear, frankly, that he unless something changed dramatically, he probably wasn't going to certify a class action, right? And during the hearing, you can almost hear Curtis's mind whirring um, as he talked to the court and 
between he and Rafael Irena, I think they realized that um, they were going to be in a more advantageous position for the named plaintiffs on their cases uh, if they would withdraw the um, if they would withdraw the uh, the class action, and whether they realize it there and then in the in the hearing or not, or whether they conferred later or, and, and decided that later, I don't know. Um, but uh, but you can read the transcript yourself and figure out what you think about you know uh, about how they thought things through. But clearly, uh, you know their lawyers working for paid clients, right? The people that they work for, and um, they had just been told that the work they were doing effectively pro bono, trying to establish a class action, probably wasn't going to be successful. They would probably have to put more effort into that if. Uh, if they did that, and if they did that, they were also being told that their plaintiffs and and the class action, if they were to get the class action, their plaintiffs wouldn't get priority. Okay, so uh, so how do you get priority for the people that are paying for their case? You kill off the class action, right? You don't put any more effort into it. Why would you put more effort into something that A, is more effort, B, you're losing that battle anyway, and C, it means that the people who've paid for your service um, uh, would be disadvantaged by that because they would be equivalent to the non-plaintiffs. So that's what they did, right? The, so Curtis pulled the plug on um, on the, the part of that lawsuit that is to do with establishing a class. Where does that leave us? Okay, what it, that was a gamble by, by Curtis and Raphael, I guess. I think it's probably a smart gamble. I don't agree. I'm not, I'm not here to judge how the, how the lawyers operate necessarily. Um, I think it's somewhat uh, sad that non-plaintiffs won't get, a, get the same opportunities as named plaintiffs. But you have to understand they're lawyers that are working for their clients and they you know they have a duty to do that first and foremost. So this is what they decided was the smartest way to do it. Um, what does it mean? Does it mean that non-plaintiffs don't have a hope? Well, more or less, right? Sort of. Um, I can't say that with 100% certainty because in the Go case, um, Although they didn't ask for that to be a uh, a class action in any way, they had early on established a, a sort of a, a a request to have all visas being reserved. Now, I've said before, I don't think we were going to get all visas being reserved, um, and I don't think Judge Mater is going to is going to do that. But I thought he was going to reserve some number. Um, but it looks pretty clear that what we'll get is. Um, he'll make some number of re reserved visas available, um, but he's going to focus on the uh, the people that have actually asked for that. He's going to, you know, Judge Meta isn't. I saw some some odd some odd comments about this today. It's like Judge Meta is is uh, doesn't care about us and he's not fighting for justice and all this sort of thing. Judge Meta is just a judge. He's he's responding to what he's asked to do. He's only going to do what he's asked to do. To, he's he's going to make a judgment um, based on what uh, people ask him to do. He can't just suddenly say, "Oh, he can't become a, a crusader on behalf of other people and start saying, well, I don't, nobody's asked me to do this, but I believe I should give everybody in the world a million dollars. You know, he can't just do that. He's, he's a judge in a federal case where he's being asked to doing some things and he'll respond to that. To that request, he's not going to start doing things that he's not been asked to do. Okay, so um, you know you can't blame Judge Meta for this, right? So where does it leave you if you're a non-plaintiff? Well, it, it's not looking good. Um, and like I said, I can't be a hundred percent sure that that non-plaintiffs won't be helped, um, but I think that's the way we're heading, frankly. Um, so between now and the end of the month. Uh, some embassies are doing more, uh, and they've made more appointment slots available. And there's there's some um, you know some good effort being made by KCC to still send out uh, two NLs. There are problems with that, and not every embassy is able to accommodate more uh, cases. But you know some have, 
right? So we've we've got roughly about a thousand more two NLs over the last few days um, since uh, since Judge Meta made his opinion known. Um, so that's not insignificant, and you know, hopefully there'll be a few more in the in the next few days. But once we get to September thirtieth, I think what we'll have by then is either the day before or or on the day of September thirtieth, Judge Meta will make an order that will reserve visas, but he'll probably only reserve some number of visas, uh, and it will only be available for the um, for the named plaintiffs in some of these cases, both Go and uh, Good Luck um, and, uh, you know, Jacob slash Rosales and so on, the consolidate, consolidated cases under Good Luck. So that's my opinion. Um, now, I, I have to say, I haven't discussed this with Curtis. Um, Curtis has, Curtis is normally very chatty on, on, um, on Twitter, uh, when he announced his decision to withdraw the class action, he didn't say anything about it. He said some other things. He's published the <coughs> he published the transcript. He hasn't said anything about that in terms of uh, explaining it or anything else like that. So he might see things differently. Um, uh, you know, perhaps I'm wrong in my assessment. Um, I don't know. Uh, and and you can feel free to believe whatever you believe. By all means, go and read the um, go and read the. Uh, let me see if I can put that available to. You. Yeah, let me. I'm going to put in the chat here. I'm going to put the uh, the link to the transcript. The transcript being, uh, you know, the the written words. Someone's taking notes of what people are saying at the hearing, and and this was what was said. Okay, so I've put that in the chat there. You're welcome to go and download it, read it, see if your assessment is the same as mine, or if you disagree, uh, that's that's up to you. Um, so let me answer a few questions. In the case of visa reservation, all plaintiffs will get an interview regardless of their DQ status. I can't guarantee that. I don't. I don't know. Um, I you know we'll have to wait and see what uh, what Judge Meta orders, how many visas he reserves, if any, uh, and and what he directs in terms of, you know, how he tells the government to behave. Um, realistically, I don't think he's going to get into the business of telling them how to prioritize cases or what order. And I don't know that he's going to reserve enough, uh, enough visas for all of the named plaintiffs. So we'll have to wait and see. Um, Right, Nasir says, uh, basically, you, you submitted in July 28th um, and you're asking now, can you submit documents without asking? Wow. Are, are you sure you're DV 2021, Nasir? Because normally, in any normal year, July 28th would already be too late to get any sort of um, you know, the, the final interviews would have been scheduled by then. So you left that. If you're serious about it being DB 2021, you, you waited a year. Uh, and no, there is, you know, it's not possible for you to get an interview because you waited way too long. So are you actually DB 2022? I don't know. But it seems like you left it too late. I don't know why. Um, so I can't be sure, Sharon, he's going to save the 24K. Um, and it would be a bit more than that because it would be the other cases as well that are consolidated. Um, and it would also probably be Go. Go, uh, I think, is going to be treated the same way. Um, and Go has a slightly different sort of case anyway. So I think Go is slightly further ahead of, of the game. Um, but I don't know that he's going to save or reserve visas for everybody. Right, I, I just don't know, Sharon. Um, we'll have to wait and see what he does. Um, okay, uh, let's see. Uh, Francois is saying you have a visa appointment for Tuesday in London. We could only schedule the medicals for Monday. That was only available. Um, right. So what will happen, Francois, is that you'll um, you'll be put on AP until you provide the medical. So in London, particularly, they don't really care. You can turn up later uh, with the medical, as it were. But what I would say to you is, and, the, and take this very seriously, when you go to your medical, 
you want to make um, you want to make it very clear to the physician that you want to pick up your uh, medical report and you want to hand deliver it yourself to the embassy. And when then when you go to the embassy, you want to make clear to them that that's what you plan to do, right? And you want to make sure that's all arranged because you've got no time to screw this up, right? You have no time to put something in the post. You have no time to rely on a courier. You have no time to uh, for the for the CO to not realize the the report has arrived. You need to make sure that everybody understands what your plan is and that you take care of that by hand yourself. And if you've got to take time off of work or whatever else, Francois, then get on and do that. Um, you know that's going to be your uh, your best plan. Uh, Chuck Cook today has has let people know, I believe, that you, as even though you're plaintiffs uh, on the go case, you need to take matters into your own hands to make sure your case is processed um, as, you know, as, as fast as possible and by the deadline if possible, right? Don't wait for reservation. Uh, you want to try and get processed before, okay? Um, do I think EU 400 is going to have the interview within October? No. Uh, DV 2022 cases are not going to be interviewed in October, uh, and they're probably not going to be interviewed in November either, not in a, any great numbers. So there will be some cases, and maybe, you know, if you're EU 400 and you're fully documentarily qualified, maybe you get a chance. But I don't think they're going to interview many cases at all um, of DV 2022 until probably December or January. Um Will there be a time limit to issue the reserve visas? I don't know. We'll have to wait and see. Uh, everyone talking about DV2021. What about DV2020? We're still unclear what will happen. We're not at all unclear what will happen. I don't know why you're saying that, Marlin. <laughs> we know that the 9,095 visas will be issued. We know that, right? Um, that's really all you need to know at the moment. Um, what we don't know is when they'll be issued or how they'll be prioritized. And yeah, there's a big questions, um, but there's nothing we can do about that. And whether you know that today or whether you know that in a month's time makes absolutely no difference, right? Uh, it just doesn't. You have to just be patient. There's no point in worrying about that at the moment uh, for DV 2020. You know that the 9,095 visas are going to be issued. We don't know who to. And I'm sorry, but you've just got to wait and find out uh, you know, how that's going to happen and when. Okay. Um, your DV 2022 winner in Asia, your current on October, blah, blah, blah. Send your bloody documents. Don't wait to be asked for your documents. There's no need to wait. Okay. You're current already. You should have already sent your documents. So don't wait to be asked. Send your documents. And if you don't know what documents to send, go to my, or just go to Google and Google my name, Britt Simon, uh, and then document procedure modification. Those three words, as well as my my name, Brit Simon, document procedure modification. And you'll get a uh, an article which has the full instructions on how you submit your documents. So get on with it, all right? Um, I'm an RGN. I would like to change the spelling of my name in my passport so I can apply with the right name. I want to change it later and do it. What's this got to do with being an RGN? Um, Okay, you're an RGM, wonderful. You'd like to change the spelling in the name of your passport so you can apply with the right name. Yeah, well, obviously your passport needs to be, um, it needs to be accurate, right? If it's not accurate, you need to get it corrected, right? As to anything else, I, I don't know what you're asking really. Make, make your question a bit more clear. Uh, yesterday I received confirmation email, DB2022. When do you expect my interview? You're 34K. You don't tell me which bloody region. Come on, I don't know what region you're in, right? So I don't know. Uh, but whatever whatever region it is, 34,000 in Africa, Asia. I don't even know if we've got an, an Asia 34K in DV 2022. But you're probably Africa or Europe. And both of those regions, we won't get to 34K for months yet. So you won't be you won't be interviewed until well into next year. Um, have they opened up DV 2023 registration? No, it, it's, ne it's never opened up in September that I've known of. It opens up in October, and they normally uh, announce the opening dates just a few days before it opens. So 
nothing's delayed, there's no problem, there's nothing unusual. DV 2023 will go ahead and the entry period will be in October. We just don't know the dates yet. Okay, so just wait, hold on. Um, you're a student from Garmin with no passport, we'll get one very, very soon. Can I pick up a form? What form? Uh, what form? Can you enter? You can enter, but you've got to have your, uh, you've got to have a passport to be able to enter the lottery. So get your passport before lottery. David, I'm glad you've uh, come on here. I saw you asked a question on my blog. So let's let's see if this is the same, the same question, David. Um, what happens to people who are DQ'd in March and uh, and are not plaintiffs? Does he have leeway to decide? Um, you're not a plaintiff, is that right, David? I can't remember. Um, uh, like I say, I'm speculating about what I think Judge Meta is going to do. If you really want, uh, you know, to know exactly what's going to happen, you have to wait until it's happened. I'm simply speculating at the moment. I'm putting two and two together and coming up with, with what I think is an answer, but I don't know. Nobody knows what, you know, what's actually going to happen. Um, does he have leeway to decide? I don't know. It's arguable. It, it, if you know, it's arguable. I don't know, David. We're going to wait and see. Um, but I'm hoping you're. Um, I'm hoping you're on a lawsuit. Um, uh, you know, because that's obviously going to be your most likely chance. I should also say, by the way, that the uh, the reconciliation bill, um, which is going through its process now. There's a possibility on that, and that that is probably going to be the next best chance for a lot of people that will miss out in DV 2021, because the reconciliation bill, as it's written today, and it's still being argued over, it's not a done deal yet, but as it's written today, includes basically the same intentions that were under the Meng 1 and Meng 2 amendments, and protects uh, visas that were not issued because of the COVID crisis. Um, and so, uh, so there's a chance for that, but it's not a done deal yet. It's just a bill being proposed. The language can get modified. We don't know if it's going to get voted through. There's some time we have to wait. And I think it's certain that we're going to have Judge Mehta's order before we have the reconciliation bill um, worked out. Okay. David, let me know if um, if you've got any follow-up questions. Um, and you can also ask me on the blog, obviously. Um, should we renew police clearance certificate? What's the best time to do so? Uh, named Go Plaintiff. No need to renew police certificates. They're now valid for two years. Um, they changed the rules on that, I think, earlier this year. Um, so they're valid for two years, so don't worry about it. No need to. Okay. Um, AF 16,000... 2022, my interview will be in Gangzhou. Uh, when do you think it will be? I don't know, next year sometime. Early next year, I'd imagine, but I, I can't be precise. I'm not trying to uh, predict, uh, you know, progress on the VB or dates or whatever. Just use some common sense. So you know that it's not going to be this week. It's not going to be this month. Uh, it's probably going to be early next year. That's, you know, that's as much as I could say, really. Uh, issue so is it possible to see two NLs without DQ before the 30th if judge reserves visas what will happen with no DQ plaintiffs um, no DQ plaintiffs okay so firstly there are about 20,000 people documentarily qualified so um, so there really is no need for um, you know for for the government right now to be scheduling interviews for people who are not documentarily qualified. So don't expect that by the 30th. That's not going to happen, right? Um, now, are they going to documentarily qualify people that are uh, that are named plaintiffs after a reservation order? That's another question. I don't know what the answer will be. It'll depend how many visas um, Judge Meta reserves. He might, he might ask the government to say, okay, of these 24,000... Uh, you know, of the 24,000 plaintiffs, how many are documentarily qualified? And they'll come up with some sort of number. And maybe based on that, they might say, okay, if you're DQ on the 30th of September, you've got a chance. If you're not, you don't. I don't know what he's going to say. I'm just speculating here. Nobody knows what he's going to decide, right? If I had to guess, I would lean towards he's going to give, you know, he doesn't, Judge Meta doesn't care, frankly, 
whether you're documentarily qualified or not. And so the government will only make that distinction if the number is less than the full amount that would need visas, 25, 26,000, whatever that, that number is. Okay, that's probably what's going to happen. Now, of course, 25, 26,000 isn't the right number because many of those plaintiffs will already be getting visas, will have got their visas or are already scheduled in the next couple of weeks, right? So the number is naturally, even if it's going to be about named plaintiffs, it's going to be less than that number, right? But we'll have to wait and see what that really means. It's just, you know, I can't predict that. Nobody can. Nobody knows. Um, Rich, do I need a police certificate where I live in the USA for more than one year? No, nope. you don't need police certificates for the USA because... <clears throat> Uh, because they can access, the FBI can access all the records of all the police um, uh, forces in the country without, you know, without you needing a police certificate. Um, and so that's the same whether you're doing adjustment of status in the USA or whether you're doing consular processing, you don't need to provide um, uh, police certificates for, more, for, for uh, USA. That's actually very clear in the instructions. You really need to read the instructions, okay? Because you wouldn't need to ask that question if you'd have read the instructions. It's very clear in there. You're the RGN question again. Uh, four of Malia, how you doing, Malia? Four of your Indonesian friends received their 2NL today without receiving DQ email. Just to be clear, Malia, just because someone didn't receive the DQ email doesn't mean they were not DQ, right? Somebody can miss the email. They don't. They don't get the email, and then all of a sudden we got rumors that people were not documentarily qualified. But uh, you know that's not really the case. That's not what's going on. They're documentarily qualifying people now. If there's an embassy where they've got capacity, but there are no documentarily qualified people in the list, it wouldn't totally shock me uh, if somehow KCC figured out which cases they could qualify to be able to use up that capacity. That's the sort of thing I would hope they're doing at the moment. I just don't know for a fact they are, right? Um, but anyway, they sent their documents without being asked uh, by KCC. Thank God for that, because they wouldn't have got um, processed otherwise. Uh, can we receive 2NL if we sent documents without being asked by KCC? Yeah, you, that's that's the point. That's why I've been telling people since January to send your bloody documents, right? It's never been necessary to wait to be asked. Um, and, you know, I, so, yeah, people have, be, have been documentarily qualified um, and, uh, you know, because they sent documents without being asked. Um, people are very confused about this DQ email, though, so, I, you know, I'm not trusting that aspect of what you're saying there, Malia. Um, but the fact that they sent their documents, that's great, right? Now, tell me someone uh, never sent documents and they got interviewed. Then I'd be kind of interested, but I don't think that exists. Okay. Um, OC 13, uh, 20, 2022, OC 1300. Can I ask how it might affect DB 2022 winners, Yuri and Cindy? Okay, the thing about DV 2022 is it's already affected, right? We've got, um, you You may have been watching the DV 2021 lawsuit, and we know that the government were told they could not apply the, um, the priority tiering, uh, which puts DV at tier four. They could not apply that to DV 2021 cases anymore. Uh, Judge Mehta already decided and instructed the government that, right? However, he didn't instruct them anything about DV 2022 because nobody it has got a DV 2022 uh, lawsuit yet, right? So that tier four um, aspect is still in place for DV 2022, which means that there isn't full capacity of any of the embassies to do DV cases, and it will slow the, uh, the process for DV 2022. We're also going to see DV 2020, and DV 2021 uh, work being done by the embassies. The DV 2021 work will be higher priority. And so DV 2022 is going to be affected, right? Now, that probably means that they're not going to issue as many visas as they should in DV 2022. And guess what that will mean? That will be more lawsuits. And the lawyers are loving that, right? <laughs> they, you know, 
uh, there's millions and millions of dollars worth of, of fees being paid on these lawsuits, right? Um, and so the lawyers are going to be more than happy to sue again because they've got winning arguments. The, it's obvious the government have misbehaved. Uh, it's very hard to lose these cases, although some lawyers have managed to lose the cases. Um, uh, but, you know, generally speaking, um, these are very easy arguments for the lawyers to make right now. They they know they can win these cases. They they are they've won six times <laughs> uh, with the same arguments over and over again. The government, you know, apart from one or two sort of technical cases that were thrown out, the government are not winning anything, right? And the government are not coming up with good arguments as to why they're not doing their job, why KCC and the embassies are not doing their job, and they're being and you know they're being told off by Judge Meta left, right, and center, right? So the lawyers are going to be more than happy to sue again, and that's probably where we'll be if things don't change. And what would have to change? Well, the biggest thing that would have to change is that tier priority thing would have to go away, right? And so that we get a normal number of, uh, of interviews in embassies, that, at least, that are open. There would still be some embassies that will remain closed for various reasons, either COVID reasons or political reasons or, you know, uh, sheer danger reasons. Um, and there's not much we can do about those embassies, but at least people could transfer to other embassies potentially, depending on the COVID crisis. So for all sorts of reasons, it's likely that DV 2022 is going to have a lot of problems. Um, and until that changes, that's the way I'm going to explain things, right? So, uh, so it's good for you that DV 2020 had all these arguments and won that case. It's good for you that DV 2021 used those same arguments to have all these other lawsuits so that we know how to win the lawsuits, right? And those same principles and procedures and, and, you know, and processes will be used in DV 2022 uh, to sue for you in that, in that case as well, okay? Uh, Sydney Embassy is not working despite the Oz government said the consular services are exempted. I've seen the, I've seen this back and forth, I think, on the immigration forum. I think, in fact, it's from yourself, Georgia. Um, yeah, um, the, 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 the um, consular services are exempted. That doesn't mean they have to open. It's up to them whether they want to expose their staff uh, to a deadly virus or not. Um, I don't quite understand how, why they can't figure out how to do that safely. But if there are lockdowns locally, there is a there's a published chart that says, here are the conditions on which you can make a decision to close your embassy. And things like localized lockdowns and services not being open and that sort of thing are some of the things that they list. So if there's a lockdown, um, localized to Sydney. Sydney embassy is not going to op open. So they're, you know, I don't think they're going to open before the end of September because there is, as I understand it, they've said that they're going to continue to be uh, closed. So, you know, that's just the way it's going to be, Georgia, I think. Um... <laughs> Thank you, Grizzly Mob, for the wishes of a happy day. Thank you very much. Um... Right, 2022 uh, uh, SA100, nice low number there. We're a couple without children. Why does KCC pro process documents of a family with children uh, with a high case number higher than ours? I'm not a rocket scientist. Um, it's not that they do that. Uh, they process they process documents and they process DS260s in case number order, but they do that from an inbox where. If you did everything, if you submitted your DS-260 on day one after finding out you're a winner, DS-260 gets submitted, you know, what, May 10th, let's say. And then May 15th, you sent in your documents. If you had done that, then you would become documentarily qualified before almost any other case. And so, you know, because you're also current, um, you would you would be ready to, to be scheduled. However... Um, don't forget that KCC have not been doing a lot of processing because they've been focusing on DV 2021. So, um, you know, so some cases that are higher than you will have become DQ because they acted before you. They listened 
uh, to advice that I was giving, for example, to send in new documents. So, you know, that's how it works. Uh, country of chargeability is Iceland. Oh, God. <laughs> oh, I hate these. So, Mohammed, you were born in Ghana, as I understand it. You live in Ghana. Why the hell did you cho choose Iceland as your country of chargeability? I guess you just rolled the mouse or something. Um, you've been selected, and so what can you do now? Here's some tough, tough, um, but straightforward advice, Mohammed. Forget it. Forget the win. You, you cannot possibly be approved. 100% certain you will be denied. So all that will happen is you'll waste your money uh, and waste your time and waste your emotional investment and you're 100% certain you're going to be guaranteed to be denied, right? The only way you could have claimed Iceland as being your country of um, chargeability is if you were married to someone from Iceland, right? Um, at the time of entry. Um, you can't go and marry someone from Iceland now and fix it. There is no fix to this. So uh, that mistake can't be forgiven. Iceland is in Europe. Ghana is in Africa. You crossed the region. You were in the wrong uh, lottery. You should have been in the Africa lottery. You were in the EU lottery. You can't fix that. There's no way to fix it. Okay. Uh, Cab explain what Kuruk said. What should we do? Go. Uh, man, uh, some tough English here. Um, Well, I don't know what, what Kirk said. I, I assume you mean Chuck, Chuck Cook, right? Um, you've got to just push your case as much as you can. That's what Chuck is saying, I believe, is push your case, right? Try and get your case done before the end of September. On the other hand, uh, he's hopeful, I believe, that he's going to get a reservation of visas order. And so, you know, that might save you later. But right now, see if you can get... Um, See if you're documentarily qualified. If you are, maybe your embassy is interviewing. You know, I don't know your situation. You, you're unfortunately you're, um, you know, not that clear. U Ukrainian. Yeah, I don't know what's going to happen in that in that particular embassy. Uh, Ahmed, um, Iraq 2022. As your CN is short, traveled to Spain in 2020. It's my travel history, but I didn't in include the house in Spain. I stayed should I or not? Um, I'll tell you what harms your case is not being totally honest. That's what harms your case, right? You have to be very transparent in this process and very honest in this process. If you, particularly as an Iraqi citizen, don't answer questions correctly, they're going to say, hmm, what's, what's this guy hiding, right? So don't hide anything. Reveal everything. Be 100% honest. So, yeah, in your case, I would say unlock. Even though you're a low case number, um, I would say unlock and correct it if you can. Um, you know. Uh, is the KCC telephone line operational now? I don't know. Um, not sure if they're answering the phone or not. I mean, the, the phone has always worked. It's just a matter of whether they um, pick up the bloody phone or not. Uh, received a KCC email document required and sent it to them yesterday. How long you'll wait for interview EU 13K? Again, EU 13,000 is not going to be current until early next year, right? So it's not going to be 2021. It'll be in 2022 at the earliest, okay? Uh, greetings, sir. I am 2020 winner from Cameroon. Um, yep, yeah, I've already explained this. Uh, they, they're going to issue 9,095 visas to some cases. I don't know which cases are going to get them, but they are going to issue those, those visas and they're just deciding how and when they'll do that process. Okay. It shouldn't really be a big deal that idiot lawyer said they'd have to wait until 2023. Um, but it's not, a, it's not a big deal. And I'm entitled by the way, to call that, that lawyer an idiot because he said I wasn't an export expert. So yeah. <laughs> um, do I think the government will cancel the DV program every freaking year that I've been doing this I've had that same question every single year and every single year I say no and every year it just carries on right so you know 
I don't know why people talk about this. Every, you know, no, it's not going to be cancelled. In fact, if you listen to what Biden wants to do, he wants to expand it from 55,000 to 80,000. Um, but no, it's not going to be cancelled for the time being. And when it is cancelled, it won't happen overnight. It will happen over a period of years. They'll give a notice period. So just for now, no, it's not going to be cancelled. Um 2022 AS20,000. Is it okay if I sent my documents to KCC in Arabic? Chargeable salary. Yeah, that's okay. Because your chargeable or your your um, documents are in in Arabic, which is the official language in Cairo, then yes, it's okay. Now, the only thing is you make it a little bit more difficult for KCC to validate your documents. So you actually delay yourself a little bit. Um, but as long as you name your documents in English appropriately, uh, so that it's obvious that this document is your birth certificate and this other document is your police certificate or whatever it is, right? Then that gives you a chance of being, um, you know, documentarily qualified fairly quickly. But I do believe it slows down uh, the process of qualifying your documents. Um, you received an email from KCC on 13th of September, says Hamad. Uh, your case number is current for interview processing. Is there any hope? Basically, it depends on which um, embassy you're at. And don't tell me, there's no point in telling me your embassy. I don't know where they're all at. But essentially, what that email meant was that you were documentarily qualified and they were actively, your name was on a list to be scheduled at, at your embassy. The question is, how big is that list and how many spaces does the embassy have? If the, if the list is only 10 people and the embassy has... 50 spaces available for interviews, then great, you're going to get an interview. If, on the other hand, which is more likely, that the list is 500 people and the embassy have 50 um, spaces available, you could be on the bottom of that and, uh, you know, and therefore not get an interview, even though you're current for interview processing, right? So that's how it works. Um, what should you do to get your interview? You keep pushing until the 30th of September. You keep doing all that you can. You make sure you've sent in your documents and do all of that, right? You try as hard as you can to make sure you followed all the procedures. And then hopefully there'll be a reservation order which will protect you after the 30th of September, hopefully. Narek, um, let me just do a few more questions here. Uh, last year, you called KCC three times on 2nd of January and the 1st of April, and last time they answered. They can see your documents, but my status is still the same. Uh, can you be class four and not five? Um, it's not me that says whether, you, whether you're, um, you know, whether you're class four or class five. The question is, did you get the, the email that says you're ready for scheduling, um, or did they approve your documents? Sounds like they didn't, so it sounds like you're probably in the group five. Uh, Golden J, I just want to appreciate it. I saw you online and all the memories came up. Now six months old in the US and in integration was great. Fantastic. It's touching. I'm very pleased for you, Golden J. Um, and six months in. I'm, I'm now seven years in. Somebody said something the other day that they just got their... Um, their green card almost seven years to the day after I got my approval. So I've been here as a green card holder for seven years. I was here just a little bit before that on an H1 visa. Um, so, you know, time flies. It's amazing how fast time flies, but I'm glad you're doing well in your first six months. Good luck to you. Um, Perseverance. What a great name for this, uh, for this process, right? Perseverance. Uh, 2022 case number is AF 31X. When is when are they likely to send an email requesting the documents? Why do you care? <laughs> Why are you not listening to me? Right? Why do you care when they send you an email for your documents? Send the bloody documents. Can I be any more clear than this? Send the documents. Don't ask. Don't wait for an email. Don't wait for permission. Send the documents. Okay. Oh man. Would you believe? One second.
Oh, man. Right. Okay, sorry about that. So send your documents, please do that. Go to, I, I said earlier what you need to do. Google Brit Simon document procedure modification, full instructions there. Okay. Floor Jan. Something new for DV22. Uh, okay, same thing. Send your documents. Send your bloody documents. I've just said all that. <laughs> Francois again. Oh, that's, that's possible. Um, that could be true. I hadn't heard of that. Um, I did do medicals uh, in London a while back um, uh, for my H1, actually, I think. Um, but that's interesting. I didn't know they were electronically processed, but confirm that. Yeah, just look into that, Francois. Just make sure it's absolutely solid, okay? Excuse my dog barking. Uh, there's somebody in my garage now. <laughs> um Okay, I answered that one earlier, I believe. 34K, yeah. Uh, 32K, which is different. It doesn't matter whether you use the entry email or a, or a new email. It doesn't matter. Uh, it doesn't matter if you send... From, I've sent emails on behalf of other people uh, to KCC, and as long as you give the right information, they'll answer the email. It's not a problem. Um, yeah, yeah. No, no, I don't know if you asked before, but um, uh, they're complaining about their their emails being overwhelmed. Yeah, absolutely. But if they answered the phone, maybe people wouldn't, you know, wouldn't be sending so many emails. Uh, hang on a second. Let me just. Oh, I don't know how to mute this thing. Uh, so, excuse me, Poppy, shut up. <laughs> okay. She's going to do her own thing. Um, okay, I'm going to look for... Uh, I'm going to look for the last few... <laughs> Brian, what a great idea. I need some merch. Send the bloody documents. Hashtag send the documents. Also. That's awesome. Yeah, I should do that. Um, all right, so... I'm just looking through here. Ahmed, you seem to be... Stop spamming, Ahmed, but uh, you live in Turkey. Oh, if you unlock. Okay, right. So that you're 2022, AS200 or whatever, you live in Turkey. If you ask KCC to unlock, um, will you lose the chance to get DQ or interview in October? You haven't got a chance to get interviewed in October. You already don't have that chance, right? Um so forget that, and don't worry. This is a general message for everyone. People need to stop worrying about being delayed and start worrying about being denied, right? It's much better to be delayed and not denied than to be not delayed but denied. Do you understand the difference? Don't focus on being delayed. Focus on getting this process right. That's what's important. Oh, this guy. Okay. Excuse me again. <laughs> okay. So, okay. Sorry about that. I'll do a few more because of that chaos. Okay. So, I hope you understand that. Delayed, denied you're much better off to be delayed than denied, right? Um, I hope I have made things a bit clearer, Amadou. I hope so. I hope that's helpful for people. And, you know, I have to say, um, the explanation I was giving earlier, like I mentioned, I haven't spoken to Curtis about it. He may have, I may have interpreted his position wrongly. Uh, he can explain himself, but he hasn't yet. So, you know, so that's why I'm reading between the lines. Okay. How do you know if your document already qualified? You get an email from KCC, and assuming you get that email, it, it, the email itself can go missing, right? So, but you get an email that says you're ready for scheduling. That congrat it starts off congratulations. You you know records show that you've given us your DS two hundred and sixty and all the documents, and you're ready for scheduling when an interview becomes available. Something on those lines. 
That's the documentarily qualified email. However, some people never get that and get interviewed because they lose the email. It goes to their spam folder and that sort of thing. So that does happen. Um, and, you know, it is quite common. Uh, it's, it's okay about the barking. I would love to see the dog again. I know. If I could, when she's like that, Malia, I can't pick her up. She's a little, a little dog. And you know what they say about little dogs, like little men. Uh, they're usually the sort of the excitable ones, right? Um, it's a cute puppy. Yeah, it really is. She's a little bit older than the puppy now. Okay. <laughs> that was a cute puppy. Shut up. Yes, puppy, please shut up. Daddy is talking with us. Brilliant, Georgia. Thank you. Um, yeah, daddy's busy. Uh, right. Let's see. I'm just trying to see if there's any sort of interesting questions. Oh, this is a good good one. Vaccine mandate is taking effect October 1st. What's the fate for people in a country where the vaccine isn't available um, for all, only elderly and underlying condition? Thanks for asking this question, Mike. Um, basically, the, the number one is if the vaccine is available to you, get the bloody vaccine. I don't want to hear about people. I, I just lost a friend last Friday. Uh, very close friend, 52-year-old guy, father of two. Um, he went from totally healthy, no underlying conditions, decent family man, lovely guy, smart guy too, but had the misfortune to live in Florida where there's all these Republicans, I idiots running around telling each other that the, that the COVID crisis isn't real and that vaccines are bullshit and, and, and you don't have to wear masks. Complete idiots, Right. And so, unfortunately, this smart guy, um, a, a originally Moroccan guy, by the way, um, I believe, Moroccan, Tunisian, uh, Salahuddin was his name. Anyway, he, in three weeks, he went from sick to dead. And I just had to uh, write a big check to support his wife the other day because he's now left a wife and two children. Um, and, you know, she needs help. And, you know, I'm, I'm sort of, I'm sad because I've lost a friend. I'm angry because he listened to idiots instead of listening to common sense. So please, everybody, if you have the opportunity to get vaccinated, get vaccinated. There's nobody dying in America who is vaccinated. All the people that are dying, about 1,500 people every day, they're all unvaccinated. Almost all of them. I shouldn't say all. There are a few older people who maybe are vaccinated that, that are succumbing anyway. But the vast, vast majority of people that are dying is because they're not vaccinated, because they listen to Trump and those morons, right? Um, now, in answer, in answer to your question, Mike, the October 1st um, change in the law will say that you have to be vaccinated uh, whether you're adjusting status in the USA or whether you're coming in from abroad, it's going to be the same thing. But if you're coming from a country where the vaccination isn't generally available, then a physician will take that into account and say, yeah, okay, that's an exemption. You've got an exemption because it's not available to you. So it shouldn't disturb um, people in the, in you know too much. But generally speaking, I mean, you come to the USA, you can walk into a pharmacy and get the vaccination straight away. Um, and, you know, and you should. Uh, you absolutely should. But if it's available to you, get it. Um, and for people who are planning to enter shortly after the 1st of October, I think they'll make it clear fairly soon. You'll probably not be forced to provide that immediately. But people attending a medical will very shortly find that they have to provide uh, vaccination proof, right? Proper proof. And again, please just take that seriously. The it's no time to be messing around with vaccination. Um, I, I tell you, I, I, I'm just thinking now. Just in case people don't know, I lost my mother to uh, to COVID. I lost several very close friends uh, to COVID, and several of my co-workers. Um, have lost, uh, have lost uh, husbands, wives, parents to COVID. It's just not, you know, not worth messing around with. It's a real thing. This COVID crisis is real, and the Delta variant is horrific. Uh, and it's a horrible, horrible way to die. By the way, you don't want to die that way. So you know, uh, be smart. If you can get vaccinated, get vaccinated. Um, okay, 
change the subject, happier stuff. 2021 Select E got 2 NL. Oh, 2 NL today afternoon. That's really good. When I wanted to show to my appointment, I saw a cancellation message. Do you know why? Um, no, I don't know why, but you got you need to persevere with that. So so first of all, when you get your, um, in most embassies, this isn't the same in every embassy, which is why I don't provide instructions on how to do this. But very often the embassies say uh, it, you have to register with this site. Usually it's like USA Travel Docs, right? And, or a version of that. And it's usually specific to the embassy or it covers a few embassies. And in that system, basically, you already have your interview appointment from KCC, so you don't need an interview. Um, but you do need to register in that appointment system. And the way you need to register is you just need to let them know your details so that they can send you the passport afterwards and that they can communicate to you uh, before the interview if there's anything to communicate. So you need to set up a um you need to register in that system for sure but you don't need to book a uh, an interview in that system because you've already got an interview okay so um look for an option there are drop down options on what you're trying to do in that system as you're trying to register and somewhere in the, in one of those options will be something where you're just registering you're not looking to arrange an interview okay so try and do that Mm. Yeah, uh, Curtis talked about Moscow, Baghdad, Kabul, and there's some other ones. Um, no news that I know for those embassies. The um, uh, They're trying to get the government to cooperate more fully, as they did last year, actually, um, uh, to transfer cases. But I don't think that's going to happen uh, in the next two weeks. They're still arguing about stupid stuff, so uh, I don't think they're going to do that generally. And and also, many of the embassies don't want people traveling into their country, uh, and you can't even travel into the country. You know, some some of the borders are closed, etc. So it's just very difficult at the moment. Um, oh, your DV twenty twenty, just wait, right? Just there's no need to call. If you call the embassy now. They won't know what the hell you're talking about. So just wait until the um, uh, until the judge gives an order. When the judge gives a formal order, when we've got the final order, then you'll probably need to call the embassy. And because your appointment was cancelled, you're in a good position to probably get one of those 9,095 visas. But it's about timing. It's about paying attention and timing your call. Don't do it now because you'll just annoy them. And there's no help in that, right? It's, it doesn't. It won't help you at all. But later on, yeah, you'll you'll call them, right? But you just have to pay attention and listen for you know news about the final judgment. Okay. Mm. How many months should be on your passport before interview? Generally, six months um, is the normal standard. You should have six months of validity beyond the interview date. Um, <coughs> but you know, go ahead and renew it. You can always keep. A copy of your old passport, either the old passport itself or photocopies. And you can show them the old and the new passport at the interview. So you can always do that. There's no harm in that. Um, okay. Uh, one or two more questions. Uh, Sharon, you asked a question earlier. I'm trying to remember your situation. So I and I can't remember your your situation, so I can't I can't say whether you should send your documents again. I don't know whether you're DV 2021, 2020, 2022, nothing. I can't remember it. So I'm sorry. You need to be a bit more clear when you repeat things. Just remember, I've got hundreds of questions here. I can't remember everybody's question. Uh, yeah, th this is um, no words. Say just waiting for September. And uh, and give up. Let's forget it. Even if there's a preservation, but not not continually. I don't know, don't know what that means. So yeah, you're sad. You're pissed off. I understand that. Um, and um, and here's someone else. I'm too stressful. Yeah, you know this is a this this is a tough process. There's no doubt about it. And some people are not going to be happy at the end of this. Um, others will have a life changing opportunity. Opportunity. Um, that's just the way it goes. And you know, 
it's it's a sad thing at times, but it's a happy thing at, at times as well. I prefer to focus on the on the happy things. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, uh, last couple of questions. Oh, Georgia again. Last question for the day. How does Doc send without being asked? Uh, without being asked helps. Won't KCC have record of who they send it? Doc request email to. Um, what's happened, Georgia, is that um, so so basically uh, the reason I tell people to send documents is because of what's happened in DV 2021. In DV 2021, all regions went current. And once all regions go current, the case number is no longer important. What's important at that point is the date on which you became documentarily qualified, right? So you can you can wait until you're asked if you want, right? And KCC will ask some cases as they go along. KCC want to organize their work, so they process DS-260s, and when the DS-260s are processed, they'll get around to sending an email to you, and then a few days later, you'll send your documents back, or maybe a month later, or whatever. But that's all delaying the process, right? So by proactively sending in your documents, it doesn't mean you're going to get a, um, a, a an appointment for interview any earlier, unless the regions go current. And if the regions go current, then it makes all the difference in the world, right? The day that you're documentarily qualified is important at that point. And that's why I tell people to do it. So just do it. Just trust me on some things. Just trust that I know a little bit more than, than you might think. So just send your bloody documents, right? Um, please. <laughs> how, how can I, how can I, you know, how can I be sort of tough on you one minute and then polite at the other? So send your bloody documents, please. Okay. Um, Okay, maybe one more question if I can find a good one here. Uh, can you, um, can you, okay, can you ask to unlock your DS260 after getting your DQ? Yes, you can. Uh, when you can't um, unlock your case is when you've been scheduled after your 2NL. But yeah, you can, you, you know, you could be DQ and ask to unlock your, your case. And then, um, your documents don't change generally, right? Your documents are your birth certificate, uh, your passport, your marriage certificate, your police certificates, etc. So you can unlock your DS-260 to change something that you've forgotten, like, um, you know, your social media stuff or your education that you didn't fill out your education and everything else. Those changes have got nothing to do with those documents, right? You were still born the same day you were born on. Your birth certificate hasn't changed. Your passport's still the same. You were still married only one time or maybe twice or whatever, but you've got your marriage documents. The documents don't change, right? So the fact that you asked to unlock your DS-260 uh, doesn't mean that you're doc no longer documentarily qualified, right? But what does happen is that you actually make your DS-260 correct, and that's important. Okay, again, back to what I said to Georgia a moment ago, trust me, I know what I'm talking about. I've been doing this for years, right? So, and I'm I'm still figuring stuff out. I have to say, DV 2021, as bad as it's been, because of the different way that it worked this year, I figured out some things this year that I didn't know before. So, for example, in years gone by, um, uh, it would get to the point where, Within a certain month, lots of cases were, um, you know, were all um, current. And then there was a weird thing because we could never understand why at a particular embassy, uh, this case number, let's say Asia 13,000, got scheduled after case number AS 18,000 or something. But both cases were um, current in that month, right? We could never understand the order. Was it alphabetical? Was it, you know, uh, what was it? Well, I now understand it's documentarily qualified, right? That's something I've learned in DV 2021. It's the date on which you became documentarily qualified. The other thing is, uh, if you listened to me a year ago talking about the, the documents procedure, I didn't understand 
how they organized the documents um, ordering, how it was processing, right? And it and through some affidavits that I read this year and through putting two and two together and investigating the data, I've managed to figure out that I'm absolutely 100% certain, and many of you think I'm wrong, I know, and you're wrong, <laughs> you're wrong, I'm not. Um, I've managed to figure out that they process documents and, uh, and uh, in a certain order, which is to do with the inbox uh, and the case number that you send your documents in, right? And I put a video out there a few weeks ago about that. And I understand that. And the reason I understand that is because DB 2021 has been so bad and it, it was it became it was different enough for me to understand more. And we've had more um, affidavits and, and documentary uh, evidence in the lawsuits, right? That's how we learn. I learned quite a lot about uh, the DB lottery from a 2012 lawsuit. Then we got some more information in 2020 and 2021. So over the years, I've been reading all of those um, all of those documents. And whilst not everything the government says in those affidavits is accurate, you can put information together if you understand business process, etc., which is what I do for a living. Um, so, um, so yeah, um, uh, that's that's just how things will work, right? Okay. All right, everybody. I, I hope that's been um, useful for you. I'm sorry about the dog. I'm sorry about the solar panel guy that came and disturbed me. Um, but, uh, you know, hopefully that's been an interesting session for you. Uh, and I hope it's a little bit clearer about what's going to happen with the, the, the lawsuit and whether you're a plaintiff or a non-plaintiff. As I said at the beginning here, I can't be 100% certain what's going to happen in the lawsuits. Uh, nobody can at this point, right? It's all speculation. Um, but I just want to, I want to give people uh, fair warning, right, to prepare emotionally for what might happen next. Um, and, you know, I'm not trying to scare anyone. I'm just trying to give you fair notice that you can sort of come to terms with it and it won't be such a shock later. But you feel free to believe whatever you want to believe, okay? All right, everybody. Thanks, then. Bye-bye now.